We welcome you to worship today, and as we do so, we acknowledge that Calvary United Church stands on Treaty 6 territory. We pay our respects to our elders, both past and present, wherever we find ourselves this morning. We recommit to our status as an affirming ministry within the United Church of Canada and strive to be an open-minded, inclusive, and welcoming place of worship. It is our deepest hope that all people might feel at home in this space, and we give thanks to God for this Sabbath day, where we join our hearts and minds in prayer. approach in faith. And this is also from the book, And When You Pray. In our faith journeys, we recall those moments when life changed for us, when we took a new path, made a startling discovery about ourselves, encountered someone who would walk beside us, maybe for just a moment, maybe for the rest of our lives. We have many descriptions for such moments. And we tend to frame most of them under the heading coincidence. And yet our biblical stories remind us that there might be other deeper descriptions for the unexpected, that our creator actually is working in our midst to direct our focus throughout our lives. We do recognize that there are moments when something in our life has changed and we have no other explanation than the belief that God is guiding us along a new pathway that God intended for us to meet this person or to encounter that experience. This truly is what it means to have faith, to experience these moments when God surprises us with unexpected possibilities. As we reflect on that theme, may our time together be indeed just such a moment of surprising possibilities. Amen. God of mercy and grace, we pray for forgiveness. We recognize that we fall short of being the faithful people you would wish us to be, and in truth we see in ourselves that we are not the faithful people we would like to be. 
Time and time again, the love that resides with us remains unspoken, unshared, locked tight with the fears that consume us. Time and time again, the compassion that begins to stir within us is stifled into dying embers, lest we commit ourselves to actions that might demand more of us than we are prepared to offer. Time and time again, the life of abundance that you call us to live and to share is obscured by our own demands, based in many instances on our misguided sense of entitlement. Forgive us, O God. Help us to rediscover the freedom you give us to be indeed all that we can be. In your love, we pray this. In the abiding love of our Creator Christ Spirit, we are forgiven. In our joy, we echo the words that Jesus used in prayer, using whatever phrasing is comfortable for us as we pray. Our Creator Christ Spirit, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The good news reminds us not only that God loves us, but also that God calls us to love one another. We celebrate God's love through our generosity. In the spirit of our Creator's abundance for us, we share our gifts, the fruits of our labors in combination with the hope in our hearts that all might find healing and peace in God's abiding love. Amen. We continue to follow some of our social distancing protocols, and so we offer to each other this morning the gift of peace in whatever way remains comfortable for us, either waving our hands or touching our elbows, all while maintaining a safe distance. Peace be with you. Scripture readings for August 14th. Isaiah 1, verses 1, 10 to 20. The vision of Isaiah, son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who asks this from your hand? Trample my courts no more. Bringing offerings is futile. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and calling of convocation. I cannot endure solemn assemblies with iniquity. 
Your new moons and your appointed festivals my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you stretch out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove your evil deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rescue the oppressed. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. Come now, let us argue it out, says the Lord. If your sins are like scarlet, will they become like snow? If they are red like crimson, will they become like wool? If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Hebrews 11, verses 1 to 3 and 8 to 16. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Indeed, by faith, our ancestors received approval. By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to set out for a place that he was to receive as an inheritance, and he set out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he stayed for a time in the land he had been promised, as in a foreign land, living in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, with Sarah's involvement, he received power of procreation, even though he was too old, because he considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one person, and this one as good as dead, descendants were born, as many as the stars of heaven and as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. All of these died in faith without having received the promises, but from a distance they saw and greeted them. They confessed that they were strangers and foreigners on the earth, for people who speak in this way make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of the land that they had left behind, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better homeland, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. Indeed, he has prepared a city for them. Luke 12, verses 32 to 40. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourselves that do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Be dressed for action and have your lamps lit. Be like those who are waiting for their master to return from the wedding banquet, so that they may open the door for him as soon as he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master finds alert when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will fasten his belt and have them sit down to eat, and he will come and serve them. If he comes during the middle of the night or near dawn and finds them so, blessed are those slaves. But know this. If the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Hear what the scriptures are saying to the church. May the thoughts that I share with you this day and the day and the ways in which each of us interprets these thoughts and integrates these within our respective faith journeys be acceptable to the one who is to us, the Word. Amen. This morning I begin with an invitation. I want you to allow your imagination to run wild for a few moments. Picture yourself standing in a crowded market square in Jerusalem, a square that is overarched by Solomon's temple, and ringed by tents, with farmers selling small animals and garden produce, while craftsfolk are selling weavings, pottery, and silverware. It is an incredibly noisy environment. And yet, above all this noise, a truly loud voice rises above the general cacophony and pronounces these words. Listen, you heavens, earth attend, for I, Yahweh, am speaking. I have reared children, I have brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. 
What are your endless sacrifices to me? I am sick of your burnt offerings. I take no pleasure in the blood of lambs and goats. Who asked you to trample through my courts? This is, in fact, first Isaiah in full flight. First Isaiah, so de designated because he is the earliest of the prophets of that name, and he is the one who warns of the disaster to befall Israel because God is displeased. And if anyone still held on to some doubt about God's displeasure, this quote certainly lays it out clearly. It has fallen upon Isaiah's shoulders to speak of God's anger and punishment to a people who will not accept that God is furious with them. We don't often make time to reflect on readings as dark as this one. It does not resonate with the theology we hold of a kind and gentle, forgiving, supporting Christ creator spirit. And yet, had we been in that market square that day, we probably would have been shaking with fear. First, Isaiah already had a reputation for being uncompromising in his analysis of Israel's wrongdoings. But even so, the level of bluntness in today's reading would have shocked the folk in the market square. But consider this. How else was Isaiah to convey the seriousness of the existing challenges facing the people of Israel? The kingdom was being ruled by weaker and weaker monarchs, and neighboring countries were anxious to acquire the rich agricultural resources that Israel all but took for granted. Difficult as it might be for us to ponder, first Isaiah's message is blunt and forthright. You have brought this on yourselves. That having been acknowledged, first Isaiah then moves on to the next chapter in this conversation, a chapter where God says, come, let us talk this over. If you are willing to obey, then you shall eat the good things of the earth. Do you hear a very loud but forming at the end of that statement? Because, of course, this being the early level of theology within ancient Israel, there is a but. There is always a but. But if you refuse and rebel, the sword shall eat you instead. Yahweh has spoken. So I say to you this morning, in echo of the words first Isaiah used, come, let us talk this over. When and how did we shift from this type of reprisal theology to a theology that speaks to the heart of a loving creator who wishes nothing but wholeness for creation? By we, I mean specifically, the theological positions we hold within the United Church of Canada. Indeed, I was reminded several years ago that there are other denominations whose members still adhere to the ancient, but if not, then statements. I was called to Gray's funeral home to meet with a family whose mother had died and who wished to have a United Church minister officiate rather than the presiding minister at that time of the Alliance Church. We had the usual getting to know each other type of conversation to begin with and discovered fairly quickly that one of the sons and I had memories of Kingston in common, he having attended Royal Military College a few years after I had graduated from Queen's Theological College. It took us a few months to return to a conversation about what they would like as part of the service for their mother. There was a significant silence as brothers and sisters looked at each other, and finally the Kingston Connected brother said, very quietly, we can tell you what we don't want. 
I, of course, invited him to expand on that, and he told me about their Down syndrome brother, who with their mother attended the Alliance Church. When that brother died, the presiding minister of the Alliance Church said during the public funeral service, but of course your brother won't be going to heaven because he did not take the Lord Jesus Christ into his heart. My immediate reaction was to blurt out to the family rather unprofessionally, though I still make no apologies for it. He can't say that. It's not for him to decide. Their story brought home to me the reality that there clearly remain theologies within the wider Christian community that cling to the ancient Hebrew belief that if something goes awry, then that must be God's punishment. And if you insist that you have done nothing to warrant God's punishment, then you just haven't been honest with yourself and you need to self-reflect until you are able to confess your sin. Never mind that I, for my part, do not believe that being a Down syndrome child is a punishment. If a family loves that child as deeply as they would any child, then surely that is another gift from our Creator. What I consider abhorrent is the kind of retributive theology where someone wonders what parents did that was so bad that God somehow punished them with the birth of a Down syndrome child. This definitely was one of those moments when I celebrated that we are members of the United Church and that whatever our shortcomings might be as human beings who seek to be faithful, our theology inspires us to hope, not to condemn. We may and can point out the wrongdoing of others, but we still pray for those doing wrong because we understand that hope remains central to our and their well-being. Hope that our God is not yet finished with us. And I equate finished with the old-fashioned version of belief in God where folk thought that God would punish someone by excluding that person from the kingdom of heaven. Luke, in his gospel, makes an effort to understand and thus explain the forgiving nature of Jesus' love for us. I find him a bit challenging in some of his writings, and then I remind myself that he probably is the last of the gospel writers to put words into ink, and that he already is dealing with a foundational community that has established some of its own unique opinions on life and death and life beyond death. And given human nature, there are already disagreements among the various Christian communities who attribute their allegiance to Paul or to Peter or to John. In the same way that I today have my own foundational disagreements with my born-again ministry colleagues. I choose to follow the gentler, arms-wide-open pathway of Jesus, who says to us, Live in God's light. Dwell within God's abiding love. You are forgiven. You are whole. You are light and love for the world. May it continue to be so for all of us. Amen.
and so we pray. Gracious, loving, ever-present Creator Christ Spirit, we are grateful for the worship we share. We are thankful for the community we experience in this sanctuary. We appreciate deeply the sense of neighborliness we have with friends and visitors who share this space with us. Today, as always, we look inward to our own lives and challenges, as well as outward to encompass the issues of the world around us. We know that there are those who wrestle with what they believe, and we include ourselves at times in that category. Remind us that faithfulness is an ongoing activity and that wrestling with our beliefs helps us define more clearly how we understand your abiding love for all creation. We also are aware that there are folk in our world who do not have the luxury of exploring their faith. In the midst of experiences of famine, war, disease, and a rigid attitude to what is proper belief, there is no room for questions. We are so grateful that we live within a community where questions are welcomed and where answers are formed within a bond of love and acceptance, even an acceptance of differences. Help us to appreciate how fortunate we are to dwell within such a life-affirming community. Throughout our faith journeys, O God, we weave a prayer of thanksgiving for creation. We give thanks for the beauty that surrounds us, for the joy of meeting once again longtime friends, for the excitement of making new friends, for the connections that are formed and the memories that are shaped by shared experiences. We give thanks for the laughter of children and grandchildren, parents and grandparents, aunts and uncles and cousins, for the joy we feel as teenagers discover their unique talents and find new ways to accomplish familiar tasks. We pray this day, O God, that your light and your love will continue to guide us along our individual and shared faith journeys. Be with those who are in hospital, we pray, whether they are processing the news of a life-ending cancer or more positively birthing a new life into our world. Be with those who are in isolation and thus lonely. Be with those in our wider community whose living space is the shelter they find under a tree or a spot in an abandoned building. Remind us of the challenges that others face as they seek to live each day, one day at a time. Be with us, O God, in our awareness, in our thanksgiving, and in our willingness to be engaged in the needs of the wider community, supporting those who have difficulties supporting themselves. Help us always to celebrate what it means to be called your children and to be filled with your love that nurtures us in so many ways. This we pray. Amen. And so we close with a blessing to send us forth. The wind that is the Holy Spirit blows where it wills. We do not hear its coming nor its going, and yet we discover the results of its presence in our actions. May the blessing of the Creator be with us as we leave this sanctuary. May the grace of the Christ encourage us to love one another. May the Holy Spirit blow through us, nurturing us to live our faith within ourselves, within our family, and within the wider community. And may God's people say to all of this, Amen, Amen, Amen.